This video is part two of my two-part series on the dinosaurs of Copper Ridge. If you haven't watched part one, I suggest you do that. It covers the biggest and most prominent tracks found at the site. In this video, I'll be focusing on these large, sharp-clawed, three-toed footprints left in this rippling sandstone in the Morrison Formation. The extensive fossil record from the Morrison Formation records an ecology that was incredibly productive. And the skeletal record shows us that there were actually three large-bodied theropod dinosaurs with the sharp clawed feet that could have left these large three-toed footprints. These animals were the apex predators of the time. The three theropods with feet large enough to make these prints were Torvosaurus, Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus. Bones from Allosaurus are by far the most abundant large theropod fossils found in the Morrison Formation. So Rebecca thought it would be best to depict this iconic predator leaving its tracks at Copper Ridge. Now despite the fact that Allosaurus has been well known to scientists and dinosaur enthusiasts alike for over a hundred years, the animal that left these tracks still provided me with an opportunity to illustrate something that really hasn't been illustrated much before. Because this animal's trackway is a bit uneven, indicating that perhaps it had a limp. Now, this animal having a limp is completely consistent with the skeletal record for Allosaurus. Numerous Allosaurus bones have been found with infections, arthritis, broken bones that have healed, often fusing in gnarly positions because there was no doctor to set them. And a few specimens have even been found with conical puncture wounds that perfectly match the tail spikes of Stegosaurus. Now, that's awesome. It's a triple whammy fossil discovery because it tells us, one, that Allosaurus was an active predator, two, Stegosaurus was a potential prey item, and three, Stegosauruses were using those huge spikes on their tail to blast into potential threats with enough force to drive their spikes into an Allosaurus's bone. That's just badass. Now, a lot of modern people who live in cities and don't have encounters with large predatory animals may not realize this, but this really isn't surprising at all. When you look closely at large predatory animals, you see a lot of injuries. Field biologist Anne Hilborn provided me with these images of African predators she's been studying, and injuries from a variety of sources are common. Some of these injuries are of ambiguous origin, like the puncture wound in the hip of this cheetah. Here we see an emaciated female lion, her body covered in scars. She's also under attack by parasites, and skewered through her front leg is the quill of a porcupine. Now injuries don't just come from prey, they can also come from other large predators in the same ecology. These amazing images shot by Eve Davidian for the Hyena Project show African lions in direct competition with hyenas for food. And contrary to the often negative public image of hyenas, lions steal hyenas kills just as much as the other way around. Now, in the Morrison ecology where Allosaurus lived alongside Ceratosaurus and Torvosaurus, I can't help but imagine perhaps a similar dynamic may have occurred from time to time over the massive carcasses of dead sauropods. And of course, injuries can also be inflicted by the same species. In fact, the reason lions have those big manes is to protect them from the claws of rival males they battle for control of territory or mates. In these dynamic photographs shot by Anne Hilborn, we see hyenas attacking another of their kind, perhaps to expel it from their territory or diminish its rank within the pack. Aaron Wersing and Tom Quinn provided me with this game camera footage of a young grizzly bear with a painful looking limp. Injuries like this often result from territorial disputes over prime fishing spots. But it's also worth noting that the main predator of young bears in North America is in fact older bears. So considering that the large theropod dinosaur that left these prints was an active predator 
that was larger than any land predator alive today, it seems completely reasonable that it might have had a limp. So in order to breathe some life into this wounded predator, I look to modern birds and reptiles for details that might help flesh this thing out. One of the things that I am always haunted by is a sort of intangible fierceness that predatory animals seem to emanate. And one of the key details that kept jumping out at me was the fact that a lot of these animals have a lot of wear and tear on their face. This is because they use their face to capture and kill their prey. So their faces are literally hardened and scarred by their lifestyle. One of the other things that jumped out at me was the intensity and clarity of these animals' eyes. Bird predators rely on their sight in order to capture their prey. And allosauruses were very bird-like. So I drew heavily on the eyes of several bird predators in order to give this thing eyes that felt appropriate for an animal that made its living by tracking down, hunting, and killing other large, powerful animals. Another interesting feature of Allosaurus is the fact that it has two crests on its skull in front of its eyes. Considering that Allosauruses are fairly closely related to modern birds, and birds often have a lot of skin and keratin augmenting the crests and casks that we see in their bones, I thought it was pretty reasonable to add a decent amount of keratin to Allosaurus's horns. Taking all of this information into account, I sketched a number of soft tissue reconstructions and sent them to Rebecca, trying to sort out how scaly should this animal be? How much quill-like plumage should it have? How scarred up and injured should it look? And what colors should it be? If this animal was a predator, it may have been an ambush predator at times, so I wanted to give it a mottled, splotchy coloration that would blend in well with the forest environment that surrounded these Morrison River systems. And of course, on its leg, we had to acknowledge that unusual, uneven trackway by showing a huge, separating wound. And in the background, a pair of stegosauruses, brandishing their impressive tail spikes, disappear into that Jurassic woodland, perhaps hinting at how our apex predator got its limp. For me, when I look at the prints of this once impressive predatory animal with a limp. I'm reminded that being an apex predator for most of Earth's history was never an easy job, but it's always been an important one. Because in a pre-human ecology, apex predators maintain healthy populations of all the other creatures that are subject to them. But we humans are different. We have technology which actually separates us from our prey and keeps us out of harm's way in a way that no other predator that I can think of in Earth's history ever has. And yet, despite having this incredibly powerful technology, our territorial and killer instincts are still intact. And as a result, modern apex predators have been extensively persecuted, and many species have already gone extinct. Studies of modern ecologies where humans have killed all of the non-human predators have shown that this is actually worse for the long-term survival of the prey species. Because in the short term, the prey species populations will explode, but often they'll explode so rapidly that they eat all of the available food and then starve in huge numbers, often dying slow, horrible deaths over cold winters or during droughts. Another very real long-term threat that even affects us humans is infectious disease, which can sweep through populations that are overcrowded. So really, the short-term brutality of predation has a long-term benefit of driving evolution towards favoring the fittest, the smartest, and the healthiest animals of both predator and prey rather than creating the conditions which drive the evolution of what's truly dangerous to humankind. Communicable disease, which in many cases has jumped from overpopulated prey species to our livestock and to us. So, thanks to modern science, we've actually learned that having a healthy population of predators around is really more beneficial 
to human survival than wiping them all out. Thanks to modern conservation efforts, there is some hope. Wild tiger populations have actually increased a little for the first time in a hundred years. American alligators and a number of other crocodilian species have made incredible recoveries in areas where they've been protected. And in North America as a whole, where wildlife management is a collaborative effort between the citizens and the government, large predator populations have rebounded since the passing of the Endangered Species Act. And most of our large predator populations are now pretty stable. And so for me, these limping prints of an animal that could destroy me so easily if it were still around are a reminder that we've actually entered a new age of predation. One in which the apex predator, that's us humans, actually has to consciously acknowledge and accept the responsibility to maintain healthy populations of all the creatures subject to us. Now while that might sound like a huge and heavy responsibility to shoulder, and it is, a huge piece of the puzzle is just maintaining enough open, contiguous land that animals can live out their lives. Fortunately, that is one of the main purposes of our state and national park system, our national forest land, and the Bureau of Land Management land, where these dinosaur footprints can be found and visited by anyone interested enough to walk up a little hill and look back into time. In the often polarized political climate of America, I hope this is something that Americans all over the political spectrum can agree on. That these public lands, which belong to all of us, are a priceless part of our American heritage and certainly shouldn't be sold off at rock-bottom prices for private development by the friends of corrupt politicians. Rather, these lands should remain open and free to use by anyone in all of their various appropriate uses, whether hiking, mountain biking, ATVing, or respectful and sustainably managed hunting, fishing, and scientific research. These lands should remain open and accessible to anyone interested in having an active and direct connection to the ancient and beautiful landscape that we all share. If you've enjoyed these videos, I hope you'll consider supporting my art, either by purchasing poster prints of my illustrations or by making a small monthly donation through Patreon. In fact, for a limited time, I'm offering signed copies of my 2016 Paleo Art Portfolio only to Patreon supporters who pledge $20 or more. Now, I know $20 is a lot to pledge every month, but after your first month's pledge has processed, I'll send you your book, and then you can adjust your Patreon pledge to any amount or delete it completely if you don't want access to the special content in my Patreon feed. That being said, if you send me a message saying that you plan on supporting me for two months or more at $20, I will gladly draw your favorite prehistoric creature in the end cover of your book. Also, I hope you'll check out the awesome work being done by the wildlife biologists who shared imagery with me for this video. You can subscribe to the Hyena Project on YouTube, and you can follow Anne Hilborn and the Alaska Salmon Project, as well as Arjun Deer and the Hyena Project on Twitter. Everything I've seen them post is fascinating and often visually stunning, so I hope you'll check them out and follow their work for updates on the amazing animals and ecologies that their research is helping our species to better understand. Thanks again for watching, and next time you're out in the wilderness at dusk, keep an eye over your shoulder. You never know when an ancient super predator might be lurking in the shadows, ready and equipped to remind you of your humble role within the larger ecosystem.